Okay, uh, hello everyone. So today we have uh, Luyao Zhang as our speaker uh, from Duke Kunshan University. So she'll be giving her talk on computer science meets economics on the Ethereum blockchain. Yeah, so uh, I feel very uh, delighted to be here and um, to share with you uh, my thoughts on um, uh, computer science meets economics um, on the Ethereum blockchain uh, research. Uh, so um, the thing I will be Okay, so talking about today, actually uh, inspired by uh, CMU pioneers. Uh, so how many of you know this person on the right-hand side? Uh, yeah, it's right-hand side. Oh, his name is Herbert uh, Seymour. Uh, I know him uh, when I was doing my PhD dissertation on bounded rationality and the mechanism design. Uh, he is actually almost the first person who define what is rationality uh, in terms of kind of like substantial rationality uh, in economics. So basically in economics, uh, substantial rationality is something like you can have epistemology rationality that for the correct belief of the world, and you can also best responding to your belief. So that is the notion of rationality in economics. Um, he um, bringing um, bounded rationality, like people can't be perfectly rational into economics and own uh, Nobel Prize in economics, uh, especially for uh, organization management. Um, and then he bring this concept uh, into computer science, become the father of AI, uh, and he um, also Turing Awards. So he has been kind of like a big inspiration of me uh, to connect computer science and economics because both fields uh, study things that are made up study things that are artificial, like economics, so we make up the system, we study it, we want to make it better. Computer, it's the same, we make up the system. Uh, and then, how many of you, there were two people on the uh, right-hand side? Probably that's more familiar. The, yeah, so I, 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 yesterday I was asking, like, I feel, I found, like, all your email has this at andrew.semu.edu. Uh, yeah, so it, it, she, he is also Andrew. Um, uh, so I think those two people, they are doing the great thing by um, connecting academia to industry. Uh, I think that's also related to the connection between computer science and economics. I, I was talking to Andrew, uh, like I have a paper in game theory proposing no, new solution concepts forthcoming, a review of economics and statistics. So, so for economic theory, we uh, need to have a notion of game theory that can model people's behavior and also we hope it exists, but that's it. So it, it can model people's behavior, can predict people's behavior and exist. But it, in computer science, we care something like it's computational efficiency. We can calculate it uh, the equilibrium in polynomial times. Uh, the second one is very um, like critical for its practical use. Uh, and the first one is something like a foundation, like it must uh, first exist in order for us to calculate it. So uh, the founders of CMU, they connected the academic industry. It's something also uh, the thing that inspires me to found uh, NPO in UK. Okay, so uh, today as talk, uh, I will be um, talking about the answers to three general questions. I think it will fit our uh, labs interest because all of you are working in different directions. Um, but I will also use one of our papers forthcoming at ACMCS uh, as a reflection example. So we don't just talk about something that's too um, metaphysics. So the first question is in general, how can the interdisciplinary methodology uh, at, at the interplay of computer science and economics, so how can it inspire research and what, what is the general methodology here we used in this paper um, that you can use to do probably new research. The second one is um, how the approach can be applied to study mechanism design um, on Ethereum blockchain to really get some data to get your hand dirty and, and answer real world problems. Uh, finally, I will also get um, the research um, connected to the most uh, recent interdisciplinary research uh, and, and uh, something talking about the future research directions. It will also include some of Eileen's work. Um, I like to talk about research in those five facets. Um, uh, that, that, that is easy to compare interdisciplinary research. 
like uh, first two, I will start here with research question, and then I will talk about methodology and application scenario. Intellectual merits is like um, what is contribution to literature and what the new research we can inspire. And finally, um, it will be a future research for, for practical impact that can be implemented in reality. The first thing is about uh, the research question. So here is a general research question. I, I think I think this one will some of you who are, if you are working on a game theory in this group will be more familiar with. Um, is uh, we if we're in economic, both in computational economics, in computer science and economics, we want to in general design the mechanism to achieve desirable outcomes. So here I, I will discuss something super interesting with you. I, if you have any different opinions or comments, feel free to interact interact with me. Uh, I, I take a little bit of time to figure the whole thing out. So I find that in economics, when we are talking about mechanism design, the first feature we care about is Pareto efficiency. So we need to first find a mechanism, for example, in auction, no matter first or second price, the first thing we care about is the product gets auctioned or allocated to the person that values it the most. We want the first to make the cake big. At the meantime, we might also care about something like user or participant incentive compatibility that you can also find in uh, how China and the Lin's paper or like the crypto literature about blockchain. Um, so that part is mainly because uh, we wanted the mechanism to work. So that, that part is actually connected to the security property, you know, computer science literature. And in economics, we also care about budget balance. So that is, um, uh, you, if you want to run a mechanism, you, you need to be sustaining um, like in the long term, not, not always needs to uh, the fund for outside. So, so in general, in economics, we, the first question we will be asking is whether we have Pareto efficiency or other notions of efficiency. But I found this very interestingly uh, in the computer science literature, it has something different and actually it's something the economic literature was um, missing about. So that, that has a privacy properties and the security properties, or we can even limit it to the consensus security pro property. So the privacy property, uh, I guess it's what kind of like Andrew is working on. So, so what is the dilemma here? The dilemma is if we have a centralized mechanism designer who is benevolent, we want to solve the problem. We want to collect the truthful information from people so we can, uh, based on the information people give, using our social choice function to mapping um, the uh, Pareto efficient allocation to different types of people. However, the centralized mechanism designer has a big assumption in traditional economic theory, they are benevolent. So they will not misuse your private information. They will also be trustworthy uh, not to collude with other people, not to corrupt. That part is super strong. And I think that's the privacy property uh, like Andrew is dealing with and also like uh, the uh, security property in, in the foundation of transaction free mechanism design paper, uh, it's mentioned as um, uh, the minor incentive compatibility and side contract proof. So it's like the minor or the minor and the user who, who are kind of like influenced this, this mechanism, they will not deviate from the protocol. Uh, I think it's very complementary because it, it, it's a way that we can push the Nobel Prize in 2007 forward to include the security properties. On the other hand, I found in the security literature, uh, sometimes uh, we don't mention uh, Pareto efficiency property. We assume you already give me a mechanism like first price, second price, it's already Pareto efficient. So, so, so th this is the difference. Another thing uh, I think both literature ha had been talking about in the computational econ literature, uh, uh, first the thing is about computational efficiency and the data efficiency. And some of the more advanced literature also talking about bounded rationality. For example, when you assume minor is myopia, can only reason for one block, not discounted, maximizing expected value for multiple blocks, that is bounded rationality. And also fairness and ethics, something like MEV, like um, order fairness. 
So, so that is the general research question we are putting here. So you can see the econ literature in general only talk about the left hand side. The computer science literature assume those are already satisfied and talk, talking about the right hand side. So I think there is a big pro, uh, opportunity here if we can um, kind of like having some synthesis. And here was uh, like an example of uh, the empirical analysis we did in our own paper. Uh, because um, we started with um, Tim Rathgarden and, and Haoshan and uh, Yuling's paper, they already have very great theoretical background and it's lacking kind of like uh, empirical evidence here. So that's why we kind of like started um, uh, with uh, the empirical analysis. Uh, I need to mention uh, for our paper here, actually we have one of Yuling's students, Katik Nayak as well. Uh, and we have uh, Yuling is kind of like uh, working in many in the industry, also my um, co-founding president for the NPO. Uh, and Sam, he was at uh, Duke and we were joint corresponding for this paper. Uh, he's not at Yale. And there are two undergraduate <laughs> students working on this project as well. So for the technical details, um, you can refer to our presentation uh, at Ethereum Foundation's events. We, we have already created an open education resource also, all the data and the code uh, we released that open education resource. Uh, so you, you you can use that in any way you want. Okay, so for this paper, we kind of like tested three properties using the real world data before and after this famous London fog. So before the London fog, the transaction fee mechanism is legacy first price transaction fee mechanism. And after it, it becomes the EIP-1559. Uh, in this paper, we use different sets of data, basically testing three things. The first thing is how the transaction fee changes. The second is how waiting time changes. The last thing is how consensus security changes um, based on our uh, features of fork rate, network load, and the minor extracted value. So if we map those to um, the theory literature, it would be something like minor incentive compatibility because for creed is like minor is not uh, following for a protocol. And network node is because when network node is larger in the CS literature, it shows minor are more likely to conduct uh, uh, malicious behavior. And the minor extracted value is related both to minor malicious behavior and also the order fairness thing. Uh, so for the waiting time in computer science literature, uh, they use the word latency more than waiting time. So that is about uh, efficiency because we all, we all have 24 hours a day. So the opportunity cost of time to transact on Ethereum is higher. We want to go somewhere else. Uh, for the transaction fee part, um, so this part is more about bounded rationality. So in uh, Professor Tim Rathgarten's paper, he shows uh, for the uh, EIP-1559 option, the uh, to be your true value is an obvious post um, uh, equilibrium, uh, but in the previous case, it's, uh, it's not that obvious. So we we actually find the result is for consensus security we don't have very find large effect from um the London fog and for the first uh, transaction phase thing we confirmed um Tim Rathgarden's results like we indeed have like um like smaller intra block um differences of the gas phase but the gas phase did not decrease too much because it's not a the London fog was not a solution for scalability. And the most interesting result that none of the previous theory had uh, any uh, prediction on, and we find innovatively is we found uh, like the London fog actually significantly reduces the waiting time. So here is kind of like a reflection to mapping uh, what we studied in this paper to uh, the general research question at the intersection of um, uh, computer science and economics. So you can see there are still a lot of questions or properties we haven't tested uh, in this paper that can be used uh, the same approach to test it. And now I will come to the methodology part. So what is our methodology? Uh, so here is, uh, I, I would love to share the slide with everyone so it could even be larger. So here is kind of like the methodology for my research agenda on uh, CSD convolution research. 
Uh, in general, here is my philosophy. I will go from induction to deduction. So first, uh, I will be asking what are the design features that affect the efficiency and fairness of maximum design on the blockchain and how? Well, I don't quite have any clue. So we hope we could have data analysis on those natural experiments, such as the London fog. So to find some clue, for example, this time we find that somehow this uh, from the data, we find that the London fog significantly decreases the la legacy or uh, the, the waiting time or the latency. So this is not uh, um, described by any theoretical literature. So to find this result will help us know um, the latency or waiting time can be affected by the some changes in the London fog. So we want to study the further and further reduce the waiting time. So, um, and afterwards, the uh, part two is we will do uh, the theory to try to find a theory behind it. And part three is we will run controlled behavioral experiment to see whether the new mechanism we design actually works with real people uh, or human AI agents before we implement it in larger scales on the blockchain. So that's in general the landscape. So we do empirical um, policy analysis, and then we need to get the insight to have a theory model to design a new mechanism. And then we get behaviorally tested before the real world implementation. And then we go back to part one again. So for this paper, for example, it belongs to the first part. And now we have another uh, continued project uh, understanding waiting time in transaction free mechanism. So that would belong to part two, or we will even have part three. Oh, question. So, what's the definition of waiting time? Oh, waiting time definition is um, when the transaction first appears in the mammal pool and the, uh, the time between that and the time is recorded on the blockchain. And so you have like large numbers that are in the yeah, yeah, yeah. Your students critique and fan, they run four different nodes to uh, record the, the um, time. The, the, the kind of like transaction first appears in, let's say, Los Angeles or a different, four different nodes, and we pick the earliest one. So, so that, that, that is actually a um, very important thing because if we uh, collect the data on ease of scan, we find 50% of the waiting time is negative because ease of scan did not run enough nodes to so that we can collect the earliest appearance. There are so many nodes running and so many mammals. I, I guess like, did you uh, like, before and after the block, like, did, did the average number of transactions, like, did the block size change? Like, I wonder, can, can you normalize the graph to block size? Like, let's say if the block size are the same, uh, the average block size is, is the same. So before, uh, uh, not not the same. So it's like before that, it's like fifteen, right? So after that, it it becomes flexible. So the maximum becomes thirty, but but it can be the fifteen is a target. Yeah, I guess that's that's why I'm asking like um, like the metric is more meaningful if the block size, the average block size is the same. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Many times in numbers, because block size becomes smaller, then that's like. A, Natural, natural thing. But if, let's say, the block has been the same and the waiting time is different, that, that may be like something related to the, you know, the, like potentially something appealing effect related to the natural waiting time. Yeah, yeah, I, I think this is a great critique. We, we should definitely check the robustness. So I, I think you are mentioning is uh, we can definitely forever increase the block size and it will reduce the waiting time. But how about like we keep the unit block size and see what, what's happening, the average block size? Yeah, I think if you somehow normalize the block size effect, which is kind of like service rate. Okay, I, I got it. And then, then you are actually studying the security effect caused by the magnitude design. Yes, sure. We, we did not test it. We, we, I think it, it will be interesting to test it. The reason is because before it's fixed, the maximum block size is fixed after it's flexible. So it, it, yeah, could, it could be it. still decreased. It's just that we did not test, uh, we did not know more. Uh, but I guess it would be helpful to know that whether the average, the, you know, the average block size is the same. Is it because of a capacity or is it because this is a queuing effect? 
yeah yeah i, I think that's a great point mm -hmm. yeah cool cool great great yeah that part is the part we did not mm, kind of like test okay so so now i will get get to the uh, uh, methodology part this is from economics um, so here is a brand new opportunity for all of you. All of you can use this methodology to study any policy changes uh, on blockchain. The reason is as follows. Uh, in economics, mm, there are three things you can do. One thing is descriptive analysis. It's like you have a data set, you just uh, describe it afterwards. What is the story? Um, the second thing is um, actually a field experiment. So that is if you want to study the policy um, of uh, intervention and, and providing the kids more education resources to go to the school, uh, do you, in general needs to apply for huge funding, go to India, go to poor places and, and do the research. So um, the both the research I just mentioned, they had on Nobel Prize in 2002 and 2019 for their contribution. So here the trade-off is between the internal and external validity. So if you run lab experiments, the subject are college students, people will argue that it will not work in reality. But if you run it in reality, first it costs a lot of money. Uh, and another thing is um, um, it might ha not have a causal effect. It might be so confounding, it might be all other factors. Uh, and this natural experiment, so EIP 1559 or London Pool, this kind of thing is kind of like a natural experiment. It's something like we do not make it happen because we want to do research, but it naturally happens. And we can collect the data before and after to do research on it and to understand better how next time we can update it. So we do not need to apply for funding to, um, to provide the incentives to, for pe people to play on the Ethereum blockchain before and after, but they are playing there. So that's why it's called it's natural experiment. So this natural experiment have uh, three great properties because of blockchain. Um, in the past, the natural experiment is still difficult to research to conduct because first, it's unpredictable. Like you, you only, uh, only after COVID has happened, you realize you should have collected data before and after COVID to study certain kinds of like research questions. Also, uh, you need to apply for this IRB kind of thing because you need to use the human uh, data. And finally, the data collection or data validity is very difficult to check. So right now, because of blockchain, all the data, like we do analysis on it, is, or is already on blockchain, it's transparent, so everyone can query it. Also, because of the asymmetric cryptography on blockchain, we don't need to apply YRB because people are de-identified already. You don't know who are the persons behind those transactions. Uh, and finally, the data collection process is also autom automatic. So, so blockchain do not need us to program things to collect the data. So that brings a really saving the research cost and, and also time cost on applying for IRB. So the thing is, we, we can also always draw figure, right? It's just to see the waiting time changes before and after, but that will not be valid for cost or inference uh, because as Eileen has mentioned, they are actually, oh, Eileen, I, I suddenly remember we actually control the whole block size. I will show you in the regression. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> so not, not, not in our figure t-test, but I remember in our regression, we control the whole block size. So the thing is, um, well, as Gilling just mentioned, we, we, we might have like mm, time trend effect and we might have log size effect. We might have the volatility of the ether price effects uh, for this before and after um, uh, in London Fox thing. So the, the method we use is called regression discontinuity. We, we used uh, the thing we think that could also affect uh, the result of waiting time as control. And after we control it, we see if there is any discontinuity um, before and after London fog for the intercept that 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 could influence uh, the waiting time, both on the trend and on the like the immediate policy effect. So, so also like I guess there's also like um, how many transactions are there, the arrival rate. So there's a like there, there are several kinds of things that would affect. Like even other things being saying that the rival rate is very Did you account for normalized those factors too? Yeah, let's see. It's the next slide. 
Yeah. So, oh, so let, let me first define our data and then we can check with seeing what other features we have control. If there are features we haven't controlled, probably we can do a robust check in the next paper because this paper is already accepted. So the first thing is uh, the London fog happens on uh, uh, August 6th. So we have the data before and after that to conduct a robustness check. We also have like, so we have 70,000 blocks before it. And then we wait until the adoption rate is about 20%. So we can have a more obvious uh, test. Uh, we, we collected the post EIP data also for 70,000 blocks. And uh, for secondary, like follow up robustness check, we collect uh, 395,000 blocks, even after that, to see if there is a obviously change. And here is a result without controlling anything. And then we also see the result for con after we controlling, like using the causal inference methods. So without controlling anything, um, like first result would be the waiting time is significantly decreased by uh, 49%. Um, percent. Uh, you, 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 if we just compare the pre and post EIP. Uh, if we also consider the robustness, the thing, it, it's still like very large, like 41% deduction. Uh, and now let's check what other thing we had control. So we had control for the block features, including block height and block size. Uh, and the exchange features, uh, that is uh, return of investment and the uh, Ethereum 19 block um, moving average volatility. So we, we control the, those features. Yeah. What do you mean by control? Like with all of these numbers, um, you can only interpret it if you like describe exactly the experimental results. Otherwise, like these numbers don't mean very much. Oh, well, control it means in the regression on the, uh, the um, significance on the waiting time deduction we observe is when we already consider those effects. Is the effect is keep keep the volatility, return of investment on either block height, block size, uh, not changed. We can still observe the. How do you think about it? Like, is it really worth looking at the change? Like, how can you make it not change? You know, but it's not like that. Oh, it's like in the regression equation, you will have all of them as the data because there is a large data so it's very dense so you you can in general find uh, the data on um, that has the same um volatility before and after eip but you still see the reduction in waiting time can you find a series where all these factors are the same like that's very difficult uh, it will not be very, very dynamic, yeah yeah it, them... yeah it will not be exactly the same because uh this is uh, like uh, you you can think of uh, of uh, as a maximum likelihood estimation. So so it's after the maximum likelihood estimation. Statistically, the difference is significant. Well, when you have a maximum likelihood estimate, you have to have a model, and then you have to make some model. I don't understand the model. Yeah, the model is linear. is is a linear model. is a simplest linear model. So it's kind of like the waiting time would equals. Um, there is um, parameter multiply whether it's before or after EIP and the um, time trend um, and the plus all the other control variables. So this is a linear model. Oh, sorry, very. I don't understand. Yeah, let's go back to this. Yeah, so ba basically um, it's a linear regression, but with um, causal inference design. So it is a y variable we want to estimate is waiting time, and the waiting time would equals a constant term, and a constant term plus whether the indicator uh, variable, whether it's before or after London fog. And then there would be the um, like parameter multiply all the control variables. That's, however, that's not what you do. You didn't plot the thing you're covering. It's plotting the, the distribution of the way it's done. Oh, uh, uh, I have, maybe, maybe I'm asking hard. The, the figures that you saw, like, what was the distribution of the data? Are they just using some statistic data, reading where you have the control variables to be comparable to one after? Or is it, is it like. Oh, this. Figure is not for the uh, discontinuity because discontinuity we can't draw figures. 
for, for the discontinuity, we run regressions and it's a very complicated regression table and it's in the paper. So you can find its significance. So this figure includes all data before and after the collection. Exactly. So it's a very hard to account for why that because we don't know whether the arrival rate mm -hmm. change, whether we don't know whether the, the, the block size change, right? Yeah, that's it's why we yeah, and that's why I'm critique this figure. I said we actually run a regression discontinuity design, and the, in the regression discontinuity design, we still find that there is a significance on the waiting time deduction. But for that, I can't draw a figure because uh, it shows controlling for the other thing, the reduction is significant. But because there are many, it's continuous, right? So I can't not, not draw a figure like controlling for. Uh, at which level and what is the percent of reduction? But but that is in the paper. So what what is the model? Like you are saying waiting waiting time is a linear function of some kind of variable. Yeah, or yeah. Why is it a linear function? Why does it make sense? Uh, this this is like the causal uh, inference literature in economics. We will. Uh, start with a linear uh, regression uh, as a simplest case. This is actually something I will critique at the end. Um, we will also um, potentially do machine learning in, in the future research. So linear model is just uh, because it's simple. It's like in computer science theoretical literature, you have a lot of something about uh, and economics as well, we have a lot of something about rationality. So in economical literature, if we have no reason to reject this linear model, we in general started with a linear model. And the linear model will end up with uh, um, like, mo like for it will have two properties we want to achieve in the estimation. First is unbiased. The second is uh, minimize the variance. Uh, when six assumptions are satisfied, linear model will satisfy this property. Yeah, I'm, I'm not convinced because there's a line of work that studies like the waiting time for the probability views, right? I mean, like, did they have um, like characterizations of like the distribution of the waiting time based on like other variables, like the arrival rate, like the distribution of the arrival, the, the service rate, uh, the job type distribution, like. So it's like in some sense, it's not well understood, like what. How the waiting time is affected by these other variables? That's going to be a Why? Why don't we use these models? Like these models, like study the children problem. It seems. I mean, this is a more complicated system because the block size. Yeah. Uh, but why don't we use these models? Like what? Yeah. Yeah. So, so the thing is, uh, the purpose of this paper is uh, we want to do a natural experiment study on the. Uh, EIP 1559 changes before and after. So we kind of like aggregate the other effects. But for what you mentioned, it's kind of like if we want to study uh, the waiting time changes due to the arrival rate, that's a theoretical research on the arrival rate. So here we have a big assumption. Uh, I think Eileen mentioned a very good point. I need to explain this. This is the background. So in general, these types of research have a big assumption because we collect the data before and after EIP, we assume all other aspects are actually not changing too much. So everything you mentioned about arrival rate and everything else, we think it, because we collect the data right after and uh, um, before the policy change. So we have to assume they are actually not changing too much. It, in a sense, we can neglect them and we focusing on testing the policy effect. But but that's also the limitation with the model. I guess that for instance, the arrival rate is a lot, right? I'm doing really, I'm not seeing it, the number of transactions can be much higher. So it's like, let's like say there are more and that's seeing after the box than before the box, then your result will be calculated by let's like say the number of times that can have seen change during the period. Yeah, yeah. If if there is something else co existing in this period, <laughs> this model will actually not be able to capture and we will need to add that feature. That, that's um, the problem for the causal inference literature in general. So, but if we identify something like that, we will need to collect the data on the NFT drop and see if it will influence the change if we will still want to draw causal inference. Yeah, so all those are great questions because this causal inference literature, um, we, we have been trying to develop strong method on it for a long time. And it actually relies on this strong assumption. Like that's why we want to carefully collect the, Big data before and after the London fog uh, to 
be most likely satisfy the assumption all other effects haven't changed too much. Um, but 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 uh, all those um, questions are excellent, and if any of you find those, it could uh, actually be a follow up question. So in general, in history, economic research would be like this. So first, if there is a policy change like a London fog, the the first research will be just uh, to collect the data before and after. If you can even collect enough data to reach any significant result, that's already defining um, paper. Uh, and then the follow-up paper will try to criticize that says, okay, we did not consider a rivalry, we did not consider an FT drop, and we'll try to add those data to the research and then to see if it makes sense. Yeah, so that's 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 great questions. Um, and then um, so for the literature, um, so this is connected to. So in you can uh, I think many of you should uh, already be very familiar with the uh, consensus literature and crypto literature in computer science. So in economics, uh, um, of course, it's connected to Mackman design paper um, that a lot of you, um, because it's already in the title, right? Transactions with Mackman design. But actually, it's more connected to the, this market design paper, uh, literature um in terms of market congestion because we are uh, testing the waiting time so uh, as really mentioned um the arrival rate paper um and the QE theory uh, is kind of like the defining papers also uh something um called um like like kind of like uh batch auctions uh all the papers in the mechanism design that has been used to study uh market congestion it's not completely applies to um the blockchain and and that, that's actually what we are trying to doing so we are trying to uh having a new model um that can model the waiting time on the ethereum blockchain when we have eip 1559 to trying to have a theory on that uh so now i will be talking about uh, uh this connection to the most recent literature um for uh, i will also be criticizing our own method as well so the first thing is you can apply the same methods to study different application scenarios or features before and after EIP. So the first uh, thing would be uh, decentralization. Our paper actually, uh, that paper is more about the um, five different kinds of definitions of decentralization and other case, but we have a small part on um, testing whether the decentralization level before and after EIP 1559 gets changed. And something else is like the network features. So, so like like there are a lot of network features such as core powerful analysis. So in, in one of our people we find the main major cores are actually coin-based and binance so in Ethereum blockchain. So we can also uh, find uh, whether before and after EIP uh, the network feature gets changed. So a recent paper from this uh, professor Chong Ning, so he's in finance, um, like very active in the uh, fintech space at Cornell University. So he did something pretty interesting. He finds um, the three things. Well, one thing is for the miners um, centralization, and another thing is for transaction, uh, and another thing is for financial inclusion. He find it uh, actually on the Ethereum blockchain is quite uh, centralized, but the EIP 1559 helped mitigate it uh, by redistribution of wealth, by burning the face of the miners. So, so that the Hayes paper actually used the, exactly the same method um, we used in this paper. And finally, you can also use this paper to study attacks to see if before and after EIP 1559, the attacking has changed. So for the two paper I cite uh, are very closely related to waiting time because their attacks is they are trying to manipulate waiting time. Uh, the EIP 1559 is like this. So you will compare the block gas use with the target block size. And if it's larger, uh, which means that right now uh, there are a lot of demand, a lot of our arrivals, uh, arrival rate is high. So in this case, you will adjust um, um, the base rate to be higher to decrease the demand so you can move back to target. So the way uh, to manipulate, you, you can actually manipulate um, it or you can manipulate as uh, a waiting time as well is you you, you can um, kind of like um, try to manipulate the block gas use. So you, if you manipulate the block gas use, you can manipulate the base state because uh, I can um, just uh, as a miner, I can put a lot of a transaction to make the system believe now there is high demand. So it will adjust the base state to be higher or the other way around. The same thing with uh, manipulating the waiting time because 
um, you will just uh, try to make the system believe uh, right now, um, um, kind of like the blockchain ha has some like a difficulties of calculation, right? So, so you make the block uh, time a little bit later and then it will adjust to the difficulty level. So that different attacks that's related to the, the waiting time can be tested as well. So those papers are listed here. So they are also about the different aspects um, that might be affected by the London book. Uh, and the same empirical approach can be used to, to test whether those features can be changed. Another related uh, work is uh, the theoretical work um, uh, from Hao Chan Yiling's paper and the Ting Raf Garden's paper. Um, so both paper um, um super interesting. I had already explained for T Raf Garden's paper, our first result confirmed with him that EIP 1559 indeed somehow makes free estimation easier. So people are not having the huge fluctuations uh, in the price. So here the connection to 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 Yilin's paper is very interesting. So in their paper, there is the impossibility theory uh, that shows when the market is congested. So that's it is mapping to their paper when the block size is not infinite, is limited. So when market is congested, oh, there could be an impossibility theory. So um, here we our result is focusing on the waiting time. So we are thinking of how we can further or reduce the waiting time. So to further reduce the waiting time uh, in a new project here is our clue. And that, that might also help mitigate the problem of impossibility theory in their paper. That is right now, uh, the EIP 1559 is very exposed. We need to first already have a market congestion such that the block gas use is higher than the target in order for the uh, system to adjust, to raise the base phase and adjust the demand. And so um, we, we can adjust it to the target. But in this case, it, it will cause two problems. One problem is uh, it, it's the waiting time will be already high in that theory. Another thing is it will happen, the impossibility theory either to have like user uh, incentive competitive problems or the, um, the other um, problems uh, in, in that the three properties cannot satisfy together. So here, what we do is we, we can use methods of, of unchained historical data to predict um, the market congestion in advance and to adjust the base fee high in advance. So it would not have such a higher demand in that block and it would just uh, not happen. And in this case, somehow we, we can potentially forever satisfy these infinite block properties uh, in the new mechanism design and, and not uh, go around the impossibility theory. Because in Ethereum blockchain, also transaction can be can, uh, canceled at any moment. So we cannot assume um, the, the existing method um, to, to go around the impossibility theory. And the thing uh, that's also related to our problem I just mentioned is a problem of market congestion, latency, waiting time, or scalability. So right now, the solution um, like from ETAP paper is focusing on the layer two solution. And what I just mentioned is kind of like a possible um, base fee adjustment mechanism that is focusing on uh, the layer one solution. OK, so now I'm going to criticize our own methods and the, uh, and answer some of uh, first answer some of the questions you just mentioned. Uh, the first thing is about the methodology. So our methodology here, um, moving forward. So first, this is not kind of like we are not doing great. It's like all, all economic literature now, um, in most of the economic literature are using these methods. Uh, and we want to do something better. So there are two ways we can do better. One is, um, this is mainly led by Susan Essie and W. Invents uh, at Stanford University. So they are doing something like machine learning plus also inference. Uh, because we already have big data, so we, we can actually embrace these methods. So, so um, I'm kind of like teaching a course machine learning for social science uh, using this method and plan to use this new method to study the Ether 2.0 upgrades. So for machine learning methods, it will be able to um, be go beyond the linear model to try different kinds of nonlinear models that might fit the waiting time and other variables like relationship better. 
But in any case, this is an empirical testing approach based on empirical data. So, it, so it, 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 it will not calculate the precise relationship between them, but it will tell from the data what is the best relationship. So machine learning will go beyond the linear model. So machine learning includes the linear regression model, but it can go like a support vector machine, a neural network, and it can test whether all the different kinds of model works and, and combine with causal inference. Uh, the second thing I want to mention is um, on Ethereum blockchain or any blockchain upgrades, actually it's a fork. So it's a fork, it makes uh, the, the process self-selection. For example, even after London fork, actually you can still choose to um, do the legacy auction, not necessarily go to the EIP-1559. So this um, makes uh, the causal inference analysis relies on another assumption. We can develop better methods to, to see if it satisfies it's like this. We might suffer from a selection bias problem. So that is the people who self-select them to EIP-1559 might have certain features to make EIP-1559 has lower waiting time. But that's not because of EIP-1559 if we keep the same group of people. So that thing is not saying we must be wrong. It's just uh, using the existing method. There is no way to know whether it's because the people self-selected them into EIP-1559 has a certain kind of property that they, they, they just have lower waiting time um, because of their participation or it's because of EIP-1559. Right now, we cannot reject uh, um, it. So we are not wrong, but we are also not showing you know, exclude this case. Uh, the second time is about uh, the second thing is about bounded rationality because now we want to really understand what happens with this, this waiting time thing, uh, as it's not modeled in the theoretical literature how like EIP one five nine is going to change the waiting time. Um, so here we we are going to model it in three perspective. Um, if we, we change the levels of bounded rationality, the first is foresight. So it's, right now, most of theoretical literature assumes miners and users are myopia. They can only reason for one um, block. So here is we can go beyond the one block because for miners who have large uh, kind of like computing power. So if you have alpha probability to, to become the person who record the transaction for the next block. So actually you can reason for multiple block and see what is the expected discounted utility. And another thing is the hindsight. So hindsight is we can actually learn from off policy and offline reinforcements learning from on-chain data um, to see what is the factors that were actually affecting the waiting time uh, before we, we, we can have a theoretical um, model. And the last thing is the insight. So we can think of the innovative um, uh, strategies on the blockchain that, that's kind of like doing the malicious attack um, that, that's, that's, uh, that's changing the waiting time. So, so there are some paper on this and I think I think like the Avid, they have a latest paper finding an attack that, that can be changing the waiting time. So um, we can also apply this to the new application scenario. So the very latest scenario you want to do is the Ethereum blockchain 2.0 upgrades. Also, there are a lot of smart contract upgrades on Ethereum blockchain. Another two, another uh, blockchain I want to mention is a blockchain for internet computer. So it has a different uh, upgrade system. It's called neural. Um, uh, it's, it's called neural network system and the nest. Uh, so which is a voting system for the whole blockchain to do upgrades. So whenever it's do, there are, there are all public data on it. We can study how it's going to change the different properties of blockchain. And finally, it's uh, there is also a service nervous system for the D apps on the internet computer. So it's kind of like a governance system for D app. Whenever it gets changed, we can also see if um, the performance gets changes. Yeah, so, so there are other related literature. So those, those are the papers uh, I'm, I'm getting involved in. It's already online. So study the different aspects of blockchain data and also um, some like theoretical literatures. And here are also something that's in progress. So most of related is the two Ethereum academic grants. So those two will 
have theory in them. So because if we are moving to part two, so one is for Ethereum 2.0 and one is for the waiting time in the transaction phase on mechanism. Um, and there are other papers involved with other aspects of blockchain as well. Um, uh, one thing I want to mention about this paper and that, that is very important for this paper to exist is all the code or program in Python as open source. Um, so for the traditional economic software such as Theta uh, and Mathematica, the econ professor is using, first it cannot process the blockchain data, it's, it's too large. They cannot process the data. Another thing is there is no directly available data software that, that will have the code can be adapted to run um, the analysis because we need to have some customization on the causal inference code in order to run our analysis for the blockchain data. So it's very important we have this um, open source software released in Python uh, so that it can um, be able to support this interdisciplinary research. But actually right now, um, like the majority of our group is still doing those in the closed software. Sometimes it might even have some problems we don't, don't even know. So, so that part is very important. And I also released all of them as open education resources. Uh, but, but, but as I mentioned, like this is kind of like the first um, paper. Uh, um, it's already very difficult because we, the thing is we need to combine all the data together and we need to program the thing in Python and it works for the large data set and for the causal inference, uh, it works. But after it works, as Yili mentioned, that there are a lot of follow-up researching we can do. Um, no matter about the methodology, we rely on the assumptions that before after no big changes, so we need to dig deeper into it, whether there is an NFT drop. Oh, maybe there could be um, the, another thing we, we, we can, we kind of like suspect that my influencer without is a flash uh, adoption um, before and after the EIP that might also influence the result. And maybe even COVID, COVID policies. So the, those can also be follow up research on the in, empirical result. Uh, but for that, I'm not quite, <laughs> actually not quite interesting and would encourage everyone else to study it. Because what I really ambitious for is for the theoretical models. Um, to yeah, to follow up on Yilin and the team Rough Gardens work, see how we can model the waiting time and how we can be, go beyond the impossibility theory and how we can uh, like reduce the waiting time by the different kinds of methods. Yeah, that's what. Okay. Uh, do you have any questions? No. <laughs> no question. Yeah, we can first stop the recording and we can talk.